Thank you very much all for coming and thank you for hosting this meeting here today. I am very happy to to say a few words about Professor Kidlan. If you don't mind, I will say it in Spanish. You know what I'm to say more or less. Eh? No, <laughs> Yo creo que le, bueno, el profesor eh, Kidlan es noruego. Se graduó en la Escuela Noruega de Economía en el año 1968 y luego hizo un doctorado en la Universidad de Carnegie Mellon en 1973 con una tesis sobre el planeamiento macroeconómico descentralizado. Eh, desde el año 78 está enseñando en los Estados Unidos, donde vive actualmente en California. Recibió, como todos ustedes saben, el honroso premio Nobel del de Banco de Suecia en Ciencias Económicas, en memoria de, de Alfred Nobel, en el año 2004, junto con Edward Prescott. Y me gusta leer lo que fue la, el anuncio del, del por qué se le dio el premio, por sus contribuciones a la macroeconomía dinámica. La consistencia las contribuciones, además la dinámica, la consistencia en el tiempo de la política económica y las fuerzas impulsoras detrás del ciclo económico. If I remember well, Professor, when I was student in the Middle Age, I remember uh, exactly Back what... When I was your <laughs> we were together. <laughs> you were younger than me. <laughs> But uh, I remember that my professor, Sir Faropa, some of you remember the big personality of this great Uruguayan economist who used to talk to us a lot about business cycle. It was very much in the center of our readings and our discussions until that famous uh, Burns and Mitchell uh, book came about the cycle. It was also something that was, was mentioned in our, in our classes. But we don't speak so much about cycle these days, it's my impression. Maybe we have already overcome the whole thing of cycle, but still, to listen to you, to tell us a little bit how you see this issue, will become a major contribution to, to our people today and to our country also. Thank you for coming, and the word is for This is a keynote, uh, supposedly, and uh, when I was thinking about what to talk about, obviously my co-author, Roman Sustek and Queen Mary would have preferred I talked about our joint paper, or uh, Christine Braun and Peter Rupert about our joint paper on labor input measurement, quality adjusted, or uh, Enrique Martinez Garcia about our, uh, I'll, I will touch upon some of uh, my research with, uh, with these people, uh, but, but I decided, especially given this is the last talk in this uh, wonderful conference, Uh, I, 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 would, I, I will uh, uh, have a little, at least I will have a little more fun and uh, talk about, I'll skim a few subjects and, uh, and then we'll see how it goes. And by the way, I don't have a single slide except this one <laughs> with text. It's all pictures. Um, uh, I listed a couple of my uh, associations. Of course, uh, I, I'm also associated with NHH, Norwegian School of Economics, also the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Dallas, and uh, the NBR. Uh, so so um, let me start off by saying uh, that after the, the well-known and bestseller book by Piketty, I started thinking about, so, so is that the biggest deal in the world? Uh, the amount of inequality and it has risen uh, as, as uh, Piketty uh, uh, suggested? It, it has risen within, uh, within given countries, like uh, in the Uri within the United States, within France, within other countries. But when you, when you think about it, The, the extent of income inequality existing 
across nations in the world is orders of magnitude greater. And so, so to, to me, that's a much, that's a, it's not that the Piketty's issue is not important, but this, this is, a, to me, a bigger issue. And once you start thinking about, well, Bob Lucas famously said that once you start thinking about uh, uh, development or lack of development in, in, in the world, it's hard to think of anything else. So, so I'll start off sh showing s some, uh, some pictures from, uh, from the world. Th these are three countries. You could think of them as more or less benchmark economies for what can be done. United States, Canada, and Australia. Uh, this is real GDP per capita. Uh, from uh, 1950 on, in uh, sorry, it's in 2005 dollars. Uh, if you if you want to convert to current dollars, you had to raise them by about 18 percent, as I recall. Um, so, so um, and also let me emphasize this: this is not on proportional scale. This is not log scale because uh, it's important to be able to look at how high the curves are in relations to other, in some countries' relation to others. Now I'll, uh, I'll, t I'll uh, show a picture of two areas of the world, the uh, three East Asian countries first, and these are Korea, Japan, and Hong Kong. Um, some of these started off rather low, uh, but, but they have uh, really grown fast. Um, in, in case you, uh, you forget about this, oh, every, I suppose everyone here understands that if you, a given slope of a curve, because it's not proportional scale, a given slope uh, far down in the picture corresponds to a much higher growth rate annually than the same slope higher up in the picture. So, so these, I regard these as uh, success for stories. They have uh, come close to converging towards the top countries, uh, except Japan has uh, had a significant slowdown in the past 20 or so years. Then I threw in uh, then uh, a different area of the, of the world, Latin America. So here, here are three examples, Mexico, Chile, and Argentina. Um, and, and doing not nearly as well. Um, and so this raises the question, why? Uh, I found the, the talk by Cavallo uh, on the first day quite interesting. Uh, and it, it ended up, he ended up by saying that uh, among Latin American countries, there's a, there's a, a there are too many trade restrictions. It's, uh, the, uh, f goods don't flow uh, across countries the way they should. And uh, he, he also, um, um, he, he also uh, complained, so to speak, about the lack of foreign, foreign direct investment coming into the region. Uh, and, and, but I admit I'm not surprised at that, at either one. Uh, and and I'll, uh, I'll talk about potential reasons for the first of those issues, and then the second probably has to do with the extent to which uh, these nations are trusted, in particular the politicians are trusted. Uh, now this, just for fun, I threw in uh, to uh, brand new countries, or fairly new, uh, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. And uh, as you can see, they fell on hard times in the beginning, but they have done really well. They are both fairly resource-rich countries, and they have uh, done well to manage their resources. High growth rates recently. Um, and and uh, it, it's interesting to think about, so, do. Are we likely to see other examples like that? It sort of suggests it can be done. And, and so, uh, for example, Cuba is 
opening up or, or let's say other countries are allowing uh, Cuba to, to uh, open up relations with um, other countries in the world. And it will be interesting to see if this will be a model for what could happen in Cuba. And, and then uh, finally, I can't end a picture like that without uh, throwing in China. And uh, many people are surprised at how low China is. Uh, this, remember, this is uh, uh, real GDP per capita, which uh, more or less is income per capita. And uh, well, I guess, I guess this is an example that if you multiply a very small number by a huge number, you can still get a big number. So they, they may still, uh, as projected, overtake the United States in terms of total economic activity in, uh, in uh, not, not long. Um, now, the, now the, the bot China, of course, is far from the bottom. Uh, I, I, here's a picture of uh, some sub-Saharan countries, and, and that's uh, obviously a depressing picture. The, this, the previous uh, slide went from zero to 50,000 on the vertical scale. This goes from all I need is zero to 10,000, and 10,000 only because I, for fun, I threw in Botswana, which is uh, one of the more successful sub-Saharan countries there, a resource-rich country, diamonds and uh, other resources. And they, they've, uh, they seem to have a fair amount of trust in the, in the world. Uh, the, uh, the rest of the picture, there are countries uh, uh, with incomes down around $1,000 per person or, or even less. Um, so so um, in thinking about why these don't grow and, uh, and what it takes to grow at, at, um, at more acceptable levels, uh, Everyone knows this, of course, but, but the key factors are, key driver is technological change. Uh, also, to take advantage of, uh, of the uh, increasing technology, uh, ca productive capacity to take advantage, advantage of it, uh, capital formation. And then, of course, uh, a factor is also human capital accumulation. Um, now, What's interesting about, about these growth promoting uh, decisions or, or factors, of course, they're, they're the outcome of the sum of uh, the decisions of thousands of, uh, um, I guess, millions of households and thousands of businesses. Uh, and, and they're very forward looking decisions. They, uh, they, they tend to cost a lot as they take place. And then the returns come over maybe uh, 10, 15 years into the future, the present value of those returns. And, and what complicates things, it, the main thing complicating things to me is that these future returns are affected by the government, by policy. So, so uh, they're affected by the tax environment, by the, by the regulatory environment. And now, and in that kind of situation, so th this is the, um, the first piece of research I'll, I'll uh, touch on where I was involved myself, the, the time and consistency of optimal government policy. So you think of a government aiming to carry out a, a good policy, uh, benign policy. Uh, the problem is, well, a, a policy is a pres prescription for what you're going to do, not, not just next year, but for the indef indefinite future. A and that, that uh, means that the future portion of this plan affects what people, what businesses do today, what households do today. But once the future comes, then, uh, then of course, uh, it, it becomes tempting to forget about the effect the future portion had on decisions that are, have already been made. So, so and um, I, re, 
I, I regard that as a big deal. I mean, Prescott and I sh showed through some examples that if that's, if that's what the government, if they succumb to, uh, to what I just described, it could be very bad for society in spite of the uh, best intentions of, uh, uh, of the government. And to me, uh, I, I didn't used to talk about that in my keynotes, but after 2008, it, I became convinced that that's, that's a, that issue is at the heart of much of the bad stuff happening in the world. And so uh, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll hold that line. Um, now, A corollary is that one needs a commitment mechanism, a, a way for the government to uh, to uh, stay the course on on the long run a long run policy. Uh, the uh, in uh, loosely speaking, if one cannot commit to a good long run policy, then policy will look like, look very short run oriented all the time. Think Argentina, uh, and so uh, um, so a commitment mechanism is, is called for. In the in the uh, monetary arena, in the case of monetary policy, there is a solution, uh, and, and that is to make uh, the central bank independent of government policy or government uh, pressure. Um, The, uh, I mean, there, there was a study by Larry Summers and the co-author ranking central banks by, on a scale of one to five in terms of the degree of, uh, of, of independence. And, uh, and then they had uh, measures of the benignness of monetary policy, and there's a clear, clear correlation. The, the more independent, the, the more benign monetary policy. Um, by and large. Now, that's, that's fine, but uh, the problem is, from the point of view of uh, growth, I would argue that monetary policy is relatively, under most circumstances, relatively unimportant for long-run growth. What really could be important is fiscal policy. And, and there's, there's no corresponding to my mind, corresponding uh, measure that has, uh, or a correlation attempted uh, of countries across the world in terms of the fiscal policy. And it is hard to see how, a, how one could possibly commit to long-run fiscal policy. And that's a, that's a big problem, and I think it's a bigger problem in some nations, especially in nations with weaker institutions, some nations can overcome that problem for various reasons. Um, now, uh, I w I'm going to use an example that Gustavo used uh, yesterday, um, but I I'll tell a slightly different story. Uh, but, but so you'll you'll see. But I'll start by looking at a different part of the world, namely Europe. So, so um, the, this, this is the same kind of picture for four uh, European countries, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and, uh, and uh, Austria. Uh, and they, uh, they pretty much follow each other. Uh, then, then I have a few more uh, countries. Uh, these are Let's see, these are Spain, Italy, and Greece. Italy actually for a, while, for a long time kept, kept um, up with the, the top countries, but they have really faltered recently. Uh, these other three countries well below the top countries. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then I'll uh, add among those four bottom countries, I'll add a fourth country, namely Ireland. Ireland is right on top of Spain. Uh, 
until 1990. And then, um, so, so he, he, here's the story I will take, tell. In, in the early 90s, Ireland decided to make tax policy completely certain. They said, if you were a foreign or domestic country, if you set up shop in Ireland, this will be your tax rates. Not, uh, not only um, in 92, 93, and so on, but all the way to 2009. Um, and this, uh, it's true that they were also not, not very high taxes. They, they, uh, by, by European standards, they were among the lower taxes. And so what happened? Within 10 years, Ireland had overtaken those two, the four top, uh, top countries. Um, one, could, uh, one could argue that, um, I mean, it's true that GNP didn't grow quite as much as GDP, but they uh, looked at the picture for GDP, and it's also a very impressive picture. Uh, so, so to me, it's it, it's the fact that Ireland made made uh, tax policy completely certain. You may wonder why uh, that would be credible. Why why would uh, why, why would everyone believe that they they're going to follow through with their with the su suggested. Uh, uh, tax plan. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I was at the conference two weeks ago where uh, someone presented growth, uh, the f f key factors of growth over the past 200 years. He a and he uh, he had all kinds of factors. He made a statement that I found kind of interesting. At some point, he said uh, he believes that culture as an important factor, but it's hard to measure. Well, it's almost as if I, uh, I, I believe him, because, uh, and I'll tell you why. So, um, so I'm, I'm from Norway. In Norway, um, you will have administrations uh, run primarily by the Labour Party for four eight-year periods, and then typically, uh, occasionally, a uh, coalition of centre to more right-oriented parties will take over, and, and they will run for four eight-year periods. You don't notice any difference. They all, uh, they all agree, uh, at least in, uh, by and large in, in economic policy. Um, and so, so, so that, from the point of view of, uh, of incentives for investing in a country, that's, that's almost like making tax policy completely certain. Uh, so, and, uh, well, People evidently believe in Norway as well, just like they believed in in, in uh, Ireland, and this has this has worked very well in the in the long run. Um, so I'm not sure if I could call it culture or not, but uh, but uh, never mind. Uh, now, so Ireland, um, so 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 this was obviously a great thing. Ireland did fail in one respect. And that is, they did not put in place. Oh, one thing I, f I forgot, and, and uh, Gustavo may be interested in this. Ireland actually came came from a reasonably favorable position because, in around 1970, they made uh, secondary education free of charge. And so, one way I could tell this story is. Ireland came into 1990 with a well-qualified, potentially well-qualified or skillful workforce, but they had no, had no capital with which to work. Uh, so, uh, 
so, that, so this, this, this is a, could be a factor if you start thinking in more detail about what happened, what happened, what was the um, skill distribution of the workforce, um, and, uh, and how did it evolve over this, uh, this very successful period. Now, the, what they did wrong was they had no, uh, they had put insufficient um, regulation in place to prevent taking advantage or uh, um, in the banking system. So, so uh, as you can see, there's a, after 2008, there's a significant dip. Uh, the uh, three major Irish banks were illiquid. The government decided to take over, and uh, uh, I'm sure lots of, a lot of economists would question that decision, both because of the incentives implied f for the future in the banking sector, but also uh, saddling taxpayers with such a huge, uh, huge increase in debt. The debt to GDP ratio uh, ro rose dramatically. So uh, now this latter fact is a reason I, at some point, realizing how poorly some countries in uh, in uh, Southern Europe had done. Uh, I thought since 2008, uh, I decided to take a look at productivity in three countries. Uh, and actually, I, yeah, those three countries are Spain, Italy, and Portugal. And I decided, because of this uh, rise in the debt to GDP ratio in Ireland, uh, I de decided to include Ireland in, in that comparison. Um, now, and one reason for doing this is after 2008, when, after Greece went bankrupt, the newspapers often talked about potential future problem countries. And, and so these were the four countries they often mentioned, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Portugal, and Ireland. So what's the productivity in these countries? So, we, so here, here's, here are pictures for, for total factor productivity in, in those four countries. When I saw those pictures, I mean, those, those are among the most shocking pictures I've seen. They basically say that in three of those countries, productivity came to a full stop after, soon after 1990. Um, the, um, the, st the straight line uh, corresponds to the average uh, growth rate or average growth of, uh, of, uh, from 1960 to 1990 extended to the present. And as you can see, we have moved further and further away from, from that straight line. Uh, if you look at another measure of productivity, lab labor productivity, uh, uh, real GDP divided by hours of work, uh, those pictures show, uh, uh, give a similar mes uh, message. These are in, on log scale, so that the, uh, uh, the straight lines really uh, represent the average growth rate from 1960 to 1990, and again extended to the present. Um, now, the, uh, the uh, TFP pictures, uh, the, they're indices, so, so you can't really compare TFP ac across uh, countries from, from, uh, from those pictures. But, but here you can. Output per, per hour work, uh, you can compare. And in Ireland, in spite of that, there's a minor slowdown in the uh, after the financial crisis. And even with that slowdown, Ireland is still about 40% 40 to 50% higher than the other three countries. So that suggests to me that unless Ireland does something really stupid in the, in the near future, they, they'll be in, in good shape in the long run. 
now, now presumably, this was part of the problem uh, after 2008, when, when uh, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, they typically would complain that, well, um, we cannot do much. We're a member of the Eurozone. Uh, we cannot change our exchange rates. Uh, uh, our hands are tied. When I saw these pictures, I was convinced that that argument was a total red herring. Uh, now, I thought so for, for a long time, but I, as I said, I've been going, I, I've been a research associate at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and they have a Spanish economist, Enrique Martinez Garcia. And, and so I started talking to him about this, this issue, and uh, I was wondering if he had any suggestion, what could have happened. And uh, for one thing, the, the slowdown started well before they became member of the Eurozone. <laughs> they became members in, I believe, in 1998. The slowdown started in the early 90s. Um, but then we, we took a look at some data. And, and, and there were some interesting features in the data. Uh, for example, it turned out that the announcement that they were going to become members was made around 1990. Starting soon almost immediately, starting soon after that announcement, after it became clear they were going to become members, interest rates started falling facing these three countries. So uh, I would interpret that, so you think of normal interest rates, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sum of uh, real component plus a nominal expected inflation component plus a country risk premium. Presumably it was the country risk premium that fell after the, everyone believed they were going to be a member of the Eurozone. And, and the country risk premium fell fairly dramatically. We're talking about five or six or seven percentage points. Um, then, then we uh, applied some theory. Uh, it, it's a I can't go into de detail about the theory, but part of this is the kind of thing I mentioned maybe two or three projects that I'm involved with in, at the moment. And if you want to know more detail, ask, send, uh, ask me for the paper. Uh, so um, uh, this is kind of a theory. If I were to compare it, I guess for trade people, it's, a, it's kind of a Balasa Samuelson kind of a mechanism. And uh, so, so actually it turns out what happened was not the big surprise. It, it fits in with theory pretty, pretty well. By the way, we, are also, we have uh, made progress and also uh, doing the same study for Italy, and Italy works well. Portugal, mm, somewhat less well. Uh, so, so Italy will be in there, and of course we'll, uh, we'll compare with a normally functioning country over that period, for example, the United Kingdom or Germany. Uh, so, so, but anyway, so after talking to uh, Enrique, I started wondering if, uh, if the euro was really a red herring. Um, ju just to give you an indication of, of, of what happened after, after 1990 in Spain, a, a way to divide activity in a nation is to uh, look at how much is produced in a tradable goods sector and how much in a non-tradable goods sector. In other words, tradable goods are goods that are 
many of them, of course, are sold domestically, but they have the potential to be sold uh, abroad. Uh, Non-tradable by their nature are, are not sold abroad. So um, e e even I need, a, every now and then, I need a haircut. That's a, even I. And so uh, that's an example of a non-tradable. Um, now, so here you can see that before 1990, in the 80s, activity was about 50-50 in, in, in the two sectors. Um, but then the two curves started diverging, and by 2008, two-thirds of activity was in the non-tradable goods sector, one-third only in the tradable good sector. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't have to be bad. Well, it depends how productive these sectors are. So, um, so here, here's a, ignore the uh, <coughs> red and the green curve. They're, they're uh, kind of uh, model experiments. The, uh, and I didn't have time to take them out of the <coughs> curve. The, the, blue, the blue line is the one you want to look at. So this is, this is uh, output per hour worked in the tradable goods sector. For example, let's say we look at what happened after, I mean, it's an index, and so it's, it's set to 100 in, in 1980. By 2008, it's up to about 200 and 25, maybe. So that's a growth rate of almost 3% a year. So that's, that's not too bad. How about the non-tradable goods sector? Well, here, here's a similar kind of, uh, of curve. Uh, starting, uh, if we look from 1980, when, when it's at 100, it gets up only to uh, 122 or something by 2008. And that's a growth rate of only a third, of a, approximately a third of a percent per year, or, or 0.3. So, so, so what happened was, as a constant, I, so, so becoming a member of the Eurozone evidently had the unintended uh, implication or the result that um, resources got transferred from relatively productive sectors to relatively unproductive sectors. <coughs> so, so this is uh, this is an, uh, another example where uh, economic policy plays a role. In this case, uh, I, I suppose it, it's not uncommon that policymakers are notorial, uh, notoriously incompetent when it comes to anticipating the effects of their changes in policy. And, and so, the, so here, here an un bad, unintended effect took place. Um, now I would like to uh, move on to uh, even another part of the world, and that's to the United States. So this, so this is real GDP per capita from 1947 when quarterly data became available from 1947 uh, to uh, the present. Um, it's on proportional scale so that the straight line, the straight line you see, the straight blue line, represents the average growth rate from 1947 to 2007 and extended to the present. And as you can see, this, you know, we have uh, cycles. Uh, uh, we have some ups and downs. Typically, uh, when in previous business cycles, when you, when you hit the bottom, then you tend to, at least uh, historically, we tended to recover fairly, fairly quickly. Um, 
the big exception is the last recession, what happened in 2008 and after. Uh, and just to focus on the last part of the picture, here, here is that blown up uh, so you can see it more clearly. Um, by by, uh, two th by uh, early 2009, we're about 10% below that straight line. By the way, that straight line works amazingly well uh, to, to, uh, to account for long-run growth in the, in the United States. Now, this, this, this recession was very different from previous recessions. It, 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 was, it ha had unusually large decline in investment. Um, it, consumption held up surprisingly well to some people. Uh, Wall Street Journal had a half-page half page article about why consumption held up so well. I'm not sure they got to the answer, but uh, uh, so that was an unusual factor. And also, unlike Unlike many uh, other previous business cycles, it, it was uh, movement in technology wasn't a big factor. Um, I have another co-author at uh, at at the Dallas Fed, and that's Carlos Sarasaga, uh, who's an Argentine. Uh, we have uh, written papers about Argentina, but in this case, we we wrote about the United States. Uh, and and that's, that's a paper that has, was published a couple of years ago in the JME, so you can take a look at it. But our idea was um, starting after the, uh, the financial crisis, lots of talk developed about uh, the seriousness of the government budget. There had been, uh, it was a combination of uh, additional temporary measures, uh, expenditure measures that were taken to try to jumpstart the economy uh, in combination with uh, major declines in revenue. And so the debt to GDP ratio shot up to levels not seen since, uh, since uh, um, World War II. And the, the Congressional Budget Office at some, at some point uh, made a report uh, estimating how much additional revenue the uh, United States would need, the government would need to generate in order to keep the debt to GDP ratio to rise even further. Uh, so, so Carlos and I decided to so the hallmark of, uh, of um, modern macroeconomics, or as I call it, aggregate economics, is uh, that uh, we, we understand that the future is very important for the present, including the expectation of uh, potential future uh, tax changes. And, and so um, uh, we, we a couple of uh, things here are kind of arbitrary, but we, we decided to uh, make the assumption that the sentiment arose in, uh, as of January 1st, 2009, among businesses that taxes would need to rise enough to satisfy this estimate by the Congressional Budget Office. Um, that's how we calibrate, calibrated the, the extent of the tax increases. What was a little arbitrary was we, we assumed that the expectation was it would take effect in 2012 and last for 10 years. Uh, and it turns out what happened in the US works. I mean, it accounts actually surprisingly well to us. It accounts for about 80% of the drop in investment uh, about 40 or 50 percent of the drop in labor input, and it's the only story of that period we know about. We're uh, uh, um, consistent with the 
with consumption holding up to the extent it did. So, so, so what, what's amazing here, as I'm sure you have observed, is that the, the curve for actual GDP is diverging more and more from the trend from the previous 70 years. Um, I could joke that in all my previous business cycle work, uh, my, my measure of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, my statistical measure of, uh, of the business cycle was one that relied on the deviation of actual GDP from trend. And so in that, by that measure, the business cycle would be over when the, uh, the economy moved from growing less than the trend to moving faster than the trend. Well, here the business cycle is not over. <laughs> well, I'm joking, uh, but, uh, and in part because um, of another factor, and that is, can we take that extension of the straight line as a good uh, estimate of what the trend will be in the future? And that's something that, that's in uh, the paper with Carlos and, and me. The, uh, we, um, we decided to um, measure the extent to which one would uh, expect that trend to change because of a change in the uh, age distribution of the population, of, and especially of the workforce. Um, it, it's well known that in the United States, the, there's a big hump in the age distribution called the baby boom. And the baby boomers, they're, they're part of the reason that many thought the, the uh, government budget constraint for the US would be in trouble already before what happened in 2008 because of the baby boomers retiring and uh, demanding more uh, from the government budget as they get older and older. Um, and so, so, so in, in that article is also an estimate of what would be a reasonable trend from, let's say, 2008 on. Slightly, slightly smaller slope, but, but still, uh, st of course, still, still growing. And it's, it's not obvious that uh, it, that trend would get closer to the actual GDP movement, but, but uh, uh, not, not quite uh, as slow, uh, slow growing. Um, now, but this, this is a, mentioning this issue is a natural transition to, uh, to, the, to another project uh, I've been working on with uh, a, a great PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Nick Pretnar, and it started off, sometimes research projects start off for completely idiosyncratic reasons. Something, you notice something by pure chance, and then, and in this case, I blame it partly on my wife, who, uh, who uh, right now she's, uh, she's in the process of writing up a pa paper, a statistical test of a cognitive test for Alzheimer's or for dementia more generally. And then this made me interested in dementia and, and, and in particular Alzheimer's, which is very serious and a growing problem. And, and, uh, and uh, so with Nick, we decided to construct a model in which we could make some pro projections for the effect on growth rates going uh, next 40, next 80, maybe next 120 years as a, as a result of, of, uh, of, of dementia. And in the process, we discovered something, and I'm sure 
I'm sure others have discovered this, but it, it was something that was natural for us to take into account, and that is the following. So again, uh, ignore the two left of, of the current period, left of 2016, just look at the, the uh, fully drawn curve and its extension to 2100. So this, this is the, um, we call it whopper. That means the working age population ratio. The working age population ratio, it's uh, the ratio of uh, people between the ages of 25 and 65 divided by those over 65. And uh, if, we'll, if we go back to 1950, um, this, so, so, the, so the ratio is on, on, uh, on the vertical uh, axis to the right, it, it's around six. Then currently it's about three and a half, and then it's projected. The, these are United Nations uh, projections. Until 2100, it's, it's projected to drop under two. That's a major, that's a major factor. And, and so we, we have a model in which we, uh, well, let me also say that the interaction of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's with the rest of the economy, economy is kind of interesting because, and that, that was how we really first got interested in, you can find data on the extent to which people take care of family members, uh, let's say they're take care of their parents or, or uh, close family members because of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a time use survey. It, it, it's not that long, but it, it goes from uh, 2002 to 2015. It covers 83,000 people. Of those 83,000 people, 10,000 reported that they are uh, spending time taking care of uh, infirm elders. Among those 10,000, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the average amount of hours they report in that activity is about five and a half. Uh, in return, for these, as an average, across these 10,000 people, there's a reduction in the hours worked by one and a half hours on the average per week. And this is all, is all per week. And, and there's also a reduction of four hours of, of leisure time. So that suggested the potential for, uh, for uh, uh, something interesting being obtained for, for the long run. Uh, now the, uh, again, ask me for the paper, uh, but let me just say that the, uh, an example of the kind of uh, experiment we, can, we, we did, we, we ran an ex experiment from, uh, from the current, from 2016, to uh, first to 2056 and then 2096. Uh, and uh, in that experiment, we compared the outcome, the growth of the economy that would have prevailed if the age distribution had stayed constant for the next 80 years, constant and the same as in 2016. Uh, the, uh, the experiment suggested that the alternative with the actual moving age distribution would result in a, uh, in a uh, 
GDP per capita that will be 17 percent lower in 2056 and 39 percent lower in 2096. We also uh, estimated the uh, the benefits to uh, suppose a, a, a cure is found for Alzheimer's. There's no such cure but uh, yet but uh, the medical profession is working very hard on that. Um, now, those, those numbers are, are not nearly a, as impressive, but, but they're significant numbers. The, uh, by 2000, uh, 2096, the effect of if, if we were to find a, uh, a cure in, um, by, by 2056, the um, the in, the uh, increase in growth would be on the order. The uh, GDP per capita would be about five and a half percent higher than otherwise. Um, now, so uh, uh, this is a this is all work that uh, is ongoing and and, uh, and we. We finished a draft of that paper a couple of weeks ago, and so sent away for it. Uh, now, let me let me switch to uh, to the issue of. Uh, so, so, as you can tell, I'm I'm jumping from topic to topic, uh, and uh, this coming topic is is not necessarily uh, something related to my own research, but uh, but is. Related, I suppose, to um, to that of one of my former students, <coughs> Ketel Storsletten, um, and it has to do with um, with China. So I, I would like to talk a little bit about China, and the top context is is going to be uh, one of the things we we learned from a, a very important paper, uh, asking a very important question. <coughs> Why doesn't productivity flow from rich to poor countries? Um, this is a paper by Hal Cole, Jeremy Greenwood, and uh, Juan Sanchez uh, a couple of years ago in uh, Econometrica. And they find that the, uh, the, the extent to which the financial system is developed is, is, a, is a big factor. And, and just to underscore that, and, and maybe in the context of, of, of talking about China, which you, you saw how low China was in that first slide uh, I showed you. And uh, it's true that they have been growing at, uh, with growth rates up around 7%, but that's not enough really to make much of a movement towards what you could call convergence. And why doesn't that happen? Uh, now, my, my, my China picture is here. And don't tell me I misspelled China. Um, so sometimes the profession, I mean, the population wasn't very lucky, but the profession is lucky to be faced with a natural ex experiment. We, 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 we don't. Uh, we don't get to experiment with policy. You cannot institute the policy and say, okay, policy, that's uh, what we'll do for the next 20 years, and then we just can't wait that long, um, and then try something else. So, so um, um, but, but this is an interesting experiment, and, and uh, uh, in a sense, that two countries were faced with the same issue. They were in a similar situation at some point in time, and then they took very different action, very different policy action. So in, in 1981, Chile and uh, Mexico found themselves, um, because of uh, low prices of their main export products, uh, 
copper in the case of Chile and uh, uh, petroleum in the case of Mexico, and, and also high international interest rates, the banking system in both countries was illiquid. In Chile, for example, banks accounting for half of the nation. Oh, I should say, I stole this picture from uh, an article by uh, Tim Kehoe and uh, Juan Carlos uh, Conesa, but it's so interesting, uh, you know, got to use it, and you'll see how it fits in with uh, what I want to say about China. Um, so, in Chile, banks accounting for um, half of the nation's deposits were illiquid. The government stepped in, and they, they decided which banks are uh, viable for the long run. The rest they let go under. Now, the, the so-called viable banks, within two or three years, they reprivatized them, and then uh, market started functioning, and then uh, market interest rates quoted, blah, blah, blah. And uh, as one could say, the project started, uh, or funding started flowing to the, to the most productive projects the way a uh, reasonably well bank, uh, functioning banking system can do. You can see that there was costly initially. The economy dropped by about 20% um, in two years. But then the economy started growing. In Mexico, they were reluctant to do what, the, uh, what Chile did. Um, they, uh, the government took over the problem banks, but they did not reprivatize them. And so they put bureaucrats in, in charge of who would get loans. And uh, if you believe that bureaucrats are the ones who know which are the best pro projects, you probably believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> and, and, and so as you can see, Mexico didn't initially drop nearly as much as Chile, but it really didn't start growing. As in 2010, they're at the same level as they were in 1981. And this, this is just uh, astounding. And it's, to me, it's an example that the, the uh, well-functioning banking system is, is of some importance. In China, and, and this, uh, this is, is something I, I look, I have uh, traveled to China many times. Uh, around Christmas, I'll be there for the fourth time since September. But I haven't really studied it except, you know, being there. But, but uh, uh, Storz Latin, along with two co-authors, Song and Silly Botti, wrote an interesting paper published in the AR a few years ago entitled Growing Like China. It's a very interesting paper. And uh, so they point out that the, uh, the problem of banks being run by the state, state-run banks, and they tend to favor the big state-owned enterprises that you know, they, they don't have much incentive to be, become very productive because uh, uh, these with, of getting loans and, uh, and uh, partly also because at least for a while, uh, until recent years, uh, uh, access to low uh, cost labor. And so, um, while, while the uh, new and upcoming enterprises, small to medium sized companies, the entrepreneurs with uh, great ideas have a hard time getting loans to finance their activities, uh, and, uh, and also they tend to get biased more, they, they tend to, they have to save up in advance of, uh, of uh, executing their project, projects and uh, they, as a consequence, they also tend to get biased more towards, uh, to, towards more uh, labor intensive activities than, than otherwise. And, and so as a consequence, there's a huge amount of resource misallocation in China. Um, these authors have estimates of the extent of that. 
and these are, these are staggering estimates. What it means is that in spite of how impressive you think China has been in the past five or 10 years, uh, using the same amount of resources, they could have grown much faster. Um, so the, um, let's see, did I have more pictures? Oh. Well, just, I did have this picture of Argentina, and that's also a depressing picture. So this is the capital stock per, uh, per working age person in Argentina. Um, you can see in this picture, the peak is, uh, took place in uh, 1981 uh, or so. Uh, now, my co-author, Carlos Sarasaga, is the one who produced this picture. And uh, I once asked him, why does it stop in 2008? Well, <laughs> y y you can imagine. This being Argentina, they just don't want to report it. I mean, the, uh, uh, they started reporting uh, uh, numbers that had nothing to do with reality, just like, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the, the reports of inflation rates uh, before the current administration had nothing to do with reality. And so Carlos says we cannot compare. But, but it's a good bet that it, it's not above or at most about the same as in 81. Now, so Carlos and I have a paper. We, I was at the Dallas Fed last week, and we did our first draft last, uh, last week. And this, this is to look into the, um, the importance of, uh, of limited commitment for a country such as Argentina. Uh, under the assumption it's, a, it's an open economy. And now, the, the big empirical uh, irregularity is, as you can see, um, Argentina sort of uh, recovered in 1991 in this picture. Um, and, and then there was a, there was a run up and then, uh, and then uh, uh, a, a big drop again by on the order of 20% from uh, 1998 to 2002. What's interesting is when you, when, you, when you look at TFP for Argentina, those two periods, that from 19, uh, 1990 to 1998, and also from 2002 on, there were, they were period with uh, significant growth of TFP. So, so uh, this is just, uh, I mean, it, the growth sh just shouldn't be that slow under those favorable assumptions. A and then what we do is we, we, um, we, we, we have a model in which, as I said, with uh, limited commitment uh, in the case of Argentina and uh, and we try to assess the empirical relevance of that. And it turns out to interact interestingly with interest rate movement. Very interesting p paper eventually. And, and so uh, I, re I recommend you ask me for that as well. Okay. So, so, so my, my, my theme today has, has, has been about the role of economic policy for long run growth. And uh, I've talked about four or five instances where I believe, uh, where to me it's especially, especially clear to me at least, and, and the effects have uh, been uh, significant. And this suggests to me, oh, one final thing. 
I forgot to, in, in the context of the United States. There are two interest, interesting things about Uni United States recently. Trade restrictions, well, to me, trade restrictions are a uh, predictable outcome of uh, time inconsistency. So I, I, I started predicting in keynotes back uh, about four years ago that we're likely to see countries uh, impose more trade restrictions over, over the foreseeable future. I admit I did not predict, predict that that push would come from the United States. Uh, but in terms of what Cavallo was saying the other day, that's, uh, that's clearly a big problem for all over Latin America. And uh, the reason, as he said, that trade flows are, are, uh, are um, they're, not, they're not very large in these countries. The other thing is the Trump tra uh, tax cut is kind of interesting also. A and uh, suppose you ask the question, what effect is that likely to have? What is the policy of uh, reducing capital tax rates to the extent he has done? My answer would be, who knows? And the reason is, we, know, we don't know the context of that policy. We, we know that that tax cut is likely to be in effect for the next couple of years, but for, from the point of view of making investment decisions, you want a much lo longer time horizon. Two years is, that's more or less the time it takes to build a new factory, and so, uh, uh, so, uh, so here's a scenario, but no one can, can predict. Here's a scenario. As a consequence of, uh, of this big tax cut, on top of the fact uh, of the baby boomers retiring, the, the government budget will really blow up much, to a much greater extent than what happened in 2008, 2009. And then... Uh, and then uh, something will have to be done about that. The time and consistency principle suggests that the most likely place you look is raising capital income taxes. That's what Carlos and I assumed in, in, uh, in, uh, in trying to account for what happened after 2008. The taxes we assumed were capital income taxes. We did try the experiment of uh, labor income taxes, but not, nothing worked. I mean, nothing fit in, in that model experiment uh, compared to what actually happened. So, but go, uh, going into the future, the, uh, to my mind, what Trump has done is introduced uh, an incredible amount of uncertainty about future economic policy and f uncertainty about future policy is is deadly for for investment behavior and uh, so um, no one can say at this point to what extent that tax cut will remain in place for after the next couple of years and uh, I imagine that business owners are they're thinking the same way I am, I imagine. And so, uh, so I, I, can't, uh, I can't predict. I think that many of the points you raised, if discussed in the Latin American perspective, will be supported. You made a very good case for persistency of economic policies or the role of central banks. Fiscality, I think, uh, is very much in the concern of our countries always, but particularly in these times. You mentioned integration, the case of, 
European Union to some of the Spain and Portugal uh, case. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned also expectations. My impression is that discussing all these things in the case of Latin America, many comments will, uh, will go into the political life of how to manage all these things in economic policy and will be probably very much the case everywhere in Latin America. But I think something which I f appreciate very much is your comments on age distribution and uh, the prospects of these things looking ahead. In Uruguay, this is a very important issue. In Latin America, it's an important issue. But particularly something which has been impressing to me in looking to these statistics is how this age structure will impact the political power in the world. And reading to the statistics of the United Nations, you could see something which something to, to reflect upon. I don't know what conclusions are to, to should raise, but one is the following. In this moment, population, the, the power of population is very much in the Pacific area. 60% of the world population will be in the Pacific. But in the year 2100, 56% will be in the, in the Atlantic area, Africa, Europe, the United States, uh, North America, and South America. So the issue is very much in the center of their concerns. And I'm very happy that you mentioned that as some kind of uh, area to continue working ahead. But also reflecting on how all these demographic trends will affect not only challenging our policies and our future expectations, but also how this will come into the future of mankind, particularly at a time when you can see the, the question of values, the persistence of different ways to look life in, in both sides. So this is something which probably you, you, you told that you published an article recently in, in the question of, of population. We will read with great, great interest. Bueno, vamos ahora a las preguntas, por favor, los que quieran hacer comentarios al profesor. My, my main concern is about the extent of uncertainty that has been introduced. Um, both leading up to the potential uh, Brexit, I mean, the break from, from uh, the European Union, but also uh, the longer, I, I'm also concerned about the longer effects. I don't know if I can say that much, particularly from the of uh, time and consistency. You could argue that it, it's an example of uh, short-termism that the nation as a whole, I mean, regardless of how the decisions were made, they were they're made in, in the form of a vote, but, but um, the, um, uh, the proponents of Brexit, as far as I can tell, could tell, we're, we're making, making uh, arguments that, to my mind, go against long-run welfare of the nation. In other words, they were thinking more about the next uh, two or five years. And so in that sense, you could, you could say that it is an example, but, but the, the main, the main um, uh, cost of the decision has to be in terms of the of uh, the amount of uncertainty that's raised, uh, what's going to happen after they uh, break, uh, what kind of arrangement will they have with other countries, uh, the uh, the Norwegian ambassador told me earlier that it, it's also an issue in Norway. What what kind of re relation will will Norway? have with a major trading partner such as the, uh, Great Britain if Brexit comes into being. Uh, 
these are all things that, that are hard to know, hard to predict. And there, there are still major policy details yet to be worked out uh, that could affect what's going to happen. And so uh, that's about all I can say. So I guess I heard it twice today, so, and I kind of resist not asking before, I'm going to ask now, which is uh, you were saying that you were predicting uh, that eventually the idea of having lower tariffs forever is going to be time inconsistent. Uh, however, compared to other policies, uh, the idea of having tariffs is very centralized by WTO and regulated and implies, I mean, there's penalties that countries uh, can have potentially being out of WTO if they start actually raising tariffs. And now I agree that this is under test what's going on with the US. So I would like to, I'm curious about understanding how were you predicting this uh, in the past? Thank you. The, this is uh, this is simply a prediction that coming from realizing that um, imposing tariff restrictions looks like a good idea to naive politicians, uh, as I'm sure most everyone in Latin America should understand that because. Uh, that's happened over and over again in, in many Latin American countries. Uh, Ohanian and co-authors had a paper about Latin America in the rear view mirror, and, and uh, they have estimates of the extent to which productivity growth slowed down as a consequence and so on. Uh, I think Trump doesn't, presumably his action is partly to uh, protect domestic industries, he, he, he forgets that in the long run that will take away much of the incentives for these industries to become more productive over time, just as has happened in, uh, over and over again in, in Latin America. Uh, but, but for some reason, it, it looks like a good idea in, in the short run uh, to Trump. Uh, it's hard to decipher, decipher his own comments, but, but it sounds like it's partly to protect, uh, his, his, uh, be, protect domestic industries. It's partly because he thinks they will, uh, he thinks the, uh, the uh, trade deficit is too, uh, too high or, you know, uh, not realizing that there's not nothing really bad about trade deficits being or balance of payments deficits being high and negative for a, for a while. Uh, an interesting model experiment is by my former student Espen Henriksen. I think it's now a paper with. It was originally his uh, summer paper at Carnegie Mellon uh, as a first year PhD student, but I I, I think. It, they have a, it has been expanded on uh, in cooperation with Tom Cooley, and uh, so, so they uh, they show that in uh, as a consequence of the differences in demographics in the United States versus Cam Canada uh, versus Japan, uh, a a growing and large deficit uh, uh, balance of payment def deficit happened until into the 2000s and maybe uh, till about now is expect uh, exactly what you would expect but then they will reverse when the when the age distribution change again and then uh, so, so I don't think Trump knows much about economic theory I'm going to make a prediction um, <laughs> If Argentina had discovered oil in 1980, 1981, my prediction is that it would have been a complete disaster. It would have been the reverse of Norway, pretty much. So um, the, the question is what institutions or what, or what rules actually led Norway to be a success vis-a-vis -vis this hypothetical idea that I have that it would have been a complete disaster for Argentina to discover oil in 1980. So I have a, I have a, I have a, I can't resist telling this story because I, in uh, around 2008, I was on the panel of the Copenhagen Consensus Center, 
They put on uh, panels to rank solutions to world problems, primarily in terms of benefit-cost ratios, but taking into account the uh, you know, uncertainty about them and uh, and uh, feasibility, etc. In different areas, and uh, and one of the solution areas was basically in, in politics, and um, one of the uh, Experts presented a solution that I didn't quite understand. So, uh, but it sounded like the following. I said, "Is this like Norway deciding uh, to um, save the oil fund for future generations?" In practice, what, what they've done is, uh, in 2002, they uh, instituted a decision rule. For those who understand uh, Norwegian handlingsregeln or in German, Handlungsregel, I guess. Uh, so this decision rule is meant to keep the uh, oil fund in, uh, intact into eternity. In other words, they, the rule says you can withdraw in 2002 4%, which is a typical uh, return on assets. Uh, and they even lowered it to uh, a couple of years ago to 3%. This is a rule that they have not yet broken. So, so, so this is what I, I told this uh, presenter in, uh, about Latin American solutions. And I said, is this the kind of thing you had in mind? He said, yes. This is very interesting, he said. Uh, Chile has a similar oil fund. A similar fund called the Copper Fund. Chile has been similarly successful. Politicians have been similarly su successful in keeping their hands off the oil, uh, Copper Fund. He said, if if the Copper Fund had been in the hands of the Argentines, it would have been gone in a jiffy. So, so I guess that's the same point. I, I agree with you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor, for your comments and particularly for coming to the <laughs>